والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القرآن المجيد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العلي العظيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم فاق النبيين في خلق وفي خنوق ولم يدانوه في علم ولا كرم مولا يا صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا رحمة للعالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله This is one of three lessons إن شاء الله تعالى leading up to the month of Ramadan The fact that we are having this lesson shows how close we are to the month of Ramadan something like approximately 17 days separate us from the beginning of that blessed month and it's important that we reflect upon the nature of Ramadan, its importance, and try and take something from that in order to prepare for it in the very few days that we have left. In the verses of the Quran that were beautifully recited uh, by the young student at the beginning, Allah Ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 183, O oh, believers, fasting has been made obligatory upon you, as was made obligatory upon those before you, so that you may become pious. Two verses later, Allah Ta'ala mentions again in Surah Al-Baqarah, in verse 185, the month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was sent down, the guidance for the people, a clear explanation of the guidance and the criterion. Then whoso of you witnesses this month, he should fast in it. Allah Ta'ala in these verses has mentioned the month of Ramadan and that great act of worship that is connected with the month of Ramadan fasting. We also note in the second verse, Allah Ta'ala mentions the revelation of the Qur'an in relation to the month of Ramadan. And insha'Allah Ta'ala, towards the end of our brief lesson today, I will focus on that aspect that is mentioned there. That inside verse 185, the month of Ramadan is named inside the Qur'an by name. If we go through the Qur'an, we find this is the month that its name is specifically mentioned from amongst the months of the year inside the Qur'an. And when this month is mentioned, Shahrul Ramadan, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ Quran, The month is described by the revelation of the Qur'an inside it. So the month is being given description, it's being given ta'rif, acquaintance with human beings from the perspective that Allah is mentioning that this month Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. So that makes the revelation of the Quran deeply connected, intricately connected with the month of Ramadan. And that is an aspect that we need to focus on inside our discussion about Ramadan. And also from the acts that we do inside Ramadan, the Quran, its recitation, pondering over it, reciting it, listening to its recitation are very important acts if the whole month inside the Qur'an has been given description from the perspective of the Qur'an being re revealed inside it. And we'll touch upon that insha'Allah ta'ala in more detail towards the end of our session. We want to have an overview of Ramadan inside this lesson. Mm. That basically what is Ramadan about? What is it concern? How should we view it? How should we understand it? <coughs> Truly we can't understand Ramadan and its virtues and its values holistically. The hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sallam tells us لو يعلم العباد ما رمضان لتمنت أمتي أن يكون السنة كلها That if the slaves of Allah, if the worshippers of Allah knew what Ramadan is then my ummah would wish that Ramadan remained the entire year. And this indicates to us that we don't understand. We don't completely understand the virtues, the blessings, the enormity, the importance of Ramadan. We want to try and understand something from it. Something about the nature of Ramadan, something about its importance. If we want to view how the early generations viewed its importance and were yearning for this month, in the work Lata'if al Ma'arif 
of Imam Ibn, Hajj, Ibn, Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hambali, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, he describes the early generations in relation to the month of Ramadan that they would supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for six months that Allah give them the ability to reach Ramadan. You know the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the onset of Rajab. Allah mabarik lana fi Rajabin wa Sha'ban wa balighna Ramadan. That Allah give us barakah inside Rajab, give us barakah inside Sha'ban, give us the ability to reach Ramadan. The early generations, the Salaf, they were so much yearning for Ramadan that they would be asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this month in advance. They would be acting upon the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would be yearning for it and longing that they reach this month and attain from its virtues. He then mentions that they would supplicate for another six months after Ramadan would pass. And in those six months, they would supplicate that Allah accept the worship of Ramadan. That Allah actually accept the worship that they had conducted inside this blessed month. If we want to understand the Ramadan and understand its virtues and its importance, it's important that we look at the verse that was recited at the beginning, verse 183 in Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah Ta'ala indicates to the fast an important act that is part of Ramadan. That the daytime of Ramadan, we pass it in a state of fasting. And fasting is a very important act then inside the month of Ramadan. Here in the Quran we are told that, O oh, you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you as it was prescribed upon those before you. Now this shows us that fasting itself, the act of abstaining from eating and drinking and restraining from, refraining from these things for the sake of Allah Ta'ala, this was an act that was done by nations prior to the nation of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which shows the importance of this act of worship that is an act of worship that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala also played, placed on the nations before though the number of days they fasted was different to the number of days of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ummah we fast 29 or 30 days in accordance with the length of the month of Ramadan according to the lunar calendar there were nations before us from the nations that followed the prophets والسلام, of the past who fasted even longer and this was in accordance to their lifespans as well and also their bodily stature the size of, of, of the creation in terms of human beings is diminishing is lowering as we move towards the end of time this nation in terms of its height average height is lower in average height in comparison to the nations that trod on this world before us from the nations that followed the prophets والسلام, before us this is mentioned a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam And in accordance with that, we have been obligated a month of fasting. And the virtues we have in our month, the month of Ramadan, in relation to the virtues that were connected to the fasting of the early, earlier nations, are much more. And this is because of our connection with the last and final Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That we've been given a specific month of fasting, and this specific month of fasting has many virtues and many blessings attached to it, not least of which is a night in which a worship inside it is better than 83 years and four months of worship, Laylatul Qadr. The scholars mention that if we reflect upon the last portion of the verse, that we are given the wisdom of this great act of fasting as لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may become pious. That fasting has been prescribed on the Ummah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it was prescribed on the nations before so that we may become pious. Thus we find as an overview of Ramadan as a way in which we should approach and understand Ramadan that Ramadan is effectively a schooling. Ramadan is effectively a madrasa into which we enter for 29 or 30 days in which Allah Ta'ala through those things which he has legislated through the things that he has informed the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has informed his Ummah through doing those acts like the act of fasting and the other acts which I will mention we are receiving a training we are receiving a development of not just the body but also the soul the body is being developed and the soul is being developed developed for what purpose? that we attain to piety piety meaning that we enact every order that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have given us and that we refrain from and avoid every prohibited thing that Allah his, and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have told us to keep away from the whole purpose of Ramadan as an overview then 
is to train the body and the soul in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fulfill the commands of Allah and avoid the prohibitions of Allah ta'ala. And if we view it in this way, we can see then that when we go inside this month, we need to leave that month with that training, with that educating, with that tarbiyah of the soul, with that upbringing of the soul, that training of the soul, the refining of the soul, and we need to carry it outside of Ramadan into the other months of the year until the following Ramadan comes. And because of the laxity of human beings, because of our shortcomings and our uh, shortcomings as human beings, our inability to maintain a high state all the time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the opportunity again in Ramadan to retrain and readjust our souls and refine them once again as training for the entire year. This is the overview of Ramadan. And inside Ramadan, there are a number of acts, a number of things, gifts that have been placed to help us train the soul, not least of which is the act of fasting, which we will speak about in more detail in a minute. If we want to understand any particular thing inside Islam, it's important we understand its name. Unlike other traditions and unlike other languages, the Arabic language, and in particular the Arabic language in relation to acts of worship and things of importance in relation to Islam, carries meanings that reflect the nature of that thing. What do we mean? Meaning that when something is named inside Islam, given a title inside Islam, we should note the title word. We should note the word by which it is being referred to. That word gives us some meanings that are contained within the act or the thing itself. How? Mufti Ahmad Yar Khan Naimi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala in his tafsir of the Quran, tafsir Naimi, he mentions the word Ramadan by which the month is known. He speaks about the nature of the word, that where is, where, what is its origin? Where does this word come from? And how does that meaning reflect inside the actual nature of Ramadan? He says either this word comes from the word Ramda'un or Ramdun, one of the two. Either Ramadan is extracted from Ramda'un or Ramdun. And there are other scholars as well who have mentioned other possible reasons for Ramadan being called Ramadan. But I'm focusing on these two particular ones which are mentioned by many of the ulama, including Imam Mufti Ahmad Yar Khan Naimi, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ali. He says, if the word Ramadan comes from the word Ramda'un, then Ramda'un in the Arabic language means the autumn rain. So why would this have a connection with the meaning of Ramadan? He says the autumn rain, when it descends upon the earth, it washes the earth, it cleanses the earth. The rain as it falls upon the earth, cleanses the earth of its impurities, and it causes a good harvest to be produced in the future. When the rain goes inside the earth, and it's trapped inside the earth, those things which are going to now be sown inside the earth, those things which are now going to grow out of the earth, are going to benefit from that rain falling inside this season. He says then, the relevance of this word in its connection to Ramadan would be, that just like the rain washes the earth and, clean and gives it a, a state of cleanliness, also we find that when we enter into Ramadan, Ramadan acts like that rain which cleanses us of our sins. We enter into Ramadan carrying the sins of the year. When we enter into Ramadan, we are showered by, by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are given the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are given the opportunity to attain salvation from the fire and the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thus, Ramadan cleanses the believer of his sins. So it is a form of training, a form also of cleansing, a month in which we are cleansed of our sins. And he says it also then prepares, it, just like the rain prepares the earth for the crops that will grow out from it, this washing inside Ramadan, this cleansing process inside Ramadan is preparing for the believer to leave the month of Ramadan and then to act upon that which he has learned inside Ramadan outside. Just like the earth will then give forth its crops and give forth its fruits in the form of plants and trees. So the believer, when he exits Ramadan after this cleansing, he should be in such a state that he now begins to give off good fruit in the form of beautiful action that is based upon the Qur'an and based upon the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
Thus, if the word Ramadan comes from Ramda'un, the autumn rain, we can see the connection and relation to what is going on inside Ramadan. But perhaps it comes from the word Ramdun. Ramdun, as we mentioned before, Ramda'un or Ramdun. Ramdun means the heat, the heat and burning. And often it relates to the heat and the burning of the intense hot season inside the lands which are uh, filled with deserts, like the lands of Arabia. The desert heat and the sand and the hotness of the sand when the sun, uh, when the sun is con continuously shining upon the, uh, the sand of uh, the Arabian desert, the sand becomes very hot, unbearable in terms of walking. Anybody who has been inside the Arab countries, if you lose your sandals and you are required to walk from the masjid back to wherever you are living, then you know how difficult it is even to walk 10, 15 meters in the mid, or just post midday sun after the Jummah prayer, for example. If somebody were to lose, lose their sandals, I'll give that example because I've experienced it. So one who's experienced can, can know the reality of that. Okay. That if you lose some, some footwear and you need to walk inside the sand, very difficult. 10, 15 meters, in fact, is so difficult inside that reality. So the burning, scorching heat, the burning, how is that related then? Ramdun, burning and the heat in, and the heat of the desert in relation to the meaning of Ramadan. He says the perspective is that when Muslims fast in the month of Ramadan, they have to endure hunger and thirst. And if you reflect on the nature of hunger and thirst inside the body, it's a form of continuous burning inside. That there is a desire to eat, there is a desire to drink, and inside there is a burning and a yearning for a person to quench his thirst, to fulfill his hunger. And he is being required to become patient upon that. Islam is telling him that the, he, must, or he, sh he or she must remain patient upon that desire to eat, patient upon that desire to drink. And in this way, we find that he is enduring the heat of hunger and the heat of thirst while we find that the word Ramdun meant the heat and the burning of the desert sand. Also, he says from another perspective, the heat and burning, when it becomes intense, causes a blaze, causes something to become a blaze, <coughs> become lit by a fire. And if we look at this from this perspective, then Ramadan has Ramdun inside it, burning, because it burns away a believer's sins. Just like we mentioned Ramdaun, the word which means the autumn rain washes away the believer's sins. Here, Ramdun, burning and blazing in the meaning of fire, indicates to the erasing and the burning away of a believer's sins when he enters into this month. So we see that it's a month of training the soul. It's a month of cleansing as well. Whether we take it from the perspective of Ramdaun, the autumn rain which cleanses the earth, or we take it from the perspective of Ramdun, the burning, scorching, of the desert which burns away the believers sins inside this month if we look at the hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam in relation to the nature of the month of Ramadan Sayyidina Abu Hurairah radiallahu ta'ala narrates from the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam that Ramadan compensates for sins until the next Ramadan in other words it wipes away a believer's sins Provided that the major sins are avoided. Here, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has informed us that the month of Ramadan is one of those acts and one of those things that wipes away the minor sins of a believer. Wipes away the minor sins of a believer until the next Ramadan. As long as the believer avoids the major sins. Quite often in the hadith that we read about the washing away of sins and the wiping away of sins, we find the scholars mention in relation to that inside their commentaries that this indicates upon the minor sins. Mm. Now, both minor and major sins require what we call tawbah. Tawbah meaning seeking forgiveness in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by repenting. Both minor and major sins require this. So this does not mean just because in some ahadith we are told that particular acts of worship, like for example, a fard prayer, delivered in Jama'ah until the next Fadd prayer or performing the Jumu'ah prayer until the next Jumu'ah and various other acts inside Islam we are told about them wiping away sins this does not mean that we are absolved from repenting for the sin one is the actual sin itself 
that is wiped away. But then there is something related to that sin, which is that we should make tawbah. And tawbah is necessary for a sin, whether it is a minor sin or a major sin. And even if we do such an act, which is mentioned in hadith, that it wipes away minor sins, the necessity of making tawbah still hangs upon us. The, the sin has been wiped, but there is something still required from us, and that remains with us until we fulfill it, which is seeking forgiveness. As for the major sins, because in this hadith related to Ramadan, we are informed, Ramadan compensates for sins until the next Ramadan, provided that the major sins are avoided. is an indication that the major sins will be wiped away by sincere tawbah. That it is required for us to make tawbah for the major sins, just like for the minor sins, but that Ramadan itself wipes away the actual act, the minor sins, but not the major ones. The major ones require that we make tawbah. And here I wanted to make clear that both require tawbah. It is the minor sins that get wiped away by particular acts that are mentioned in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. So we are required that we avoid the major sins if we want our minor sins wiped out inside of Ramadan. We spoke about it being a madrasa and that it contains inside Ramadan, it's a schooling. It's a form of cultivating of the soul and the body, preparing it for, for the rest of the year by making the body and soul come in line with the commands of Allah. لَعَلَّكُمْ تتقون. We have told that the purpose of fasting, one of the major divine wisdoms that's been placed inside fasting that we've been told about is that perhaps we will attain to piety. What acts are there inside Ramadan that we need to focus on? That inside the schooling, this madrasa that we said, is, which is Ramadan, which acts are inside it? Which lessons are inside it that we need to take part in and ensure uh, that we leave the month having been cleansed? That we leave the month having been trained? The scholars of Islam have turned towards the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that relate to Ramadan and extracted from it that there are a number of major acts of worship inside the month of Ramadan. And a believer who wants to make the most of Ramadan needs to make sure that he takes a portion of each single one of these acts and that he does not leave Ramadan except that he has taken something from each one of these. From amongst the scholars that have extracted this, again, is Imam Ahmad Yar Khan Naimi rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. Inside his tafsir, tafsir Naimi, he mentions five special worships in Ramadan. He says that in Ramadan, in particular, there are five major acts of worship that a believer should make sure that he does not enter and exit from Ramadan except that he focuses on them. Number one is that which we've already mentioned, that the daytime of a believer is encompassed in fasting. Unless there is a valid reason for leaving the fast, that is something for our next lesson, inshallah ta'ala, in which we will look at some of the major, uh, major rulings that relate to the month of Ramadan. And inshallah, there will be handouts given uh, in that lesson in, rela in relation to the major rules that are relating to Ramadan. There are five special worships that he says in Ramadan. The first is fasting. Fasting during the daytime, that's from the true dawn, from the beginning of Fajr, until the time of Maghrib. This time, one of the major acts that a Muslim is required to do inside this time of Ramadan is the act of fasting. And we'll speak about some of its virtues in a moment. In the night time, in the night time, we are, we are required to perform taraweeh. Whether that's in congregation for the males in the masjid or where the women folk perform it at home. Taraweeh, the standing inside Ramadan, which is a sunnah, which is mu'akkada, an emphasized sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa a practice of the Sahaba ikiram ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi and the successive generations until our time. It's an emphasized sunnah, and an emphasized sunnah is such a sunnah that we should not leave without a valid reason. I.e. leaving an emphasized sunnah once without a valid reason is considered blameworthy. A person is considered blameworthy for having left a sunnah mu'akkada once without a valid reason. And if a person makes it a habit habitually leaves a sunnah mu'akkada, then he actually gains sin. According to the Hanafi school, a person who is a person who abandons the sunnah mu'akkada on a regular basis without a valid reason actually becomes a sinner. The sin isn't as... Here we should be careful that we don't view it in terms of it's less sin. But 
in terms of the gradings of the rules of the Sharia, the sin of leaving something which is Sunnah Mu'akkada isn't as deep as the sin of leaving something which is wajib necessary and isn't as deep in terms of sin as leaving a fard. However, it is still in the sphere of sin, mm -hmm. leaving a sunnah mu'akkada. And the scholars have said the reason for this is that it is a habitual practice of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And according to some of the scholars from the narration that they have extracted, that a person will not receive some of the specific shafa'at intercessions of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Day of Judgment if he is one who abandons the sunnah mu'akkada. What do we mean by the special shafa'at? We know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the Day of Judgment, he will open the doors of shafa'a, intercession. Intercession meaning pleading on behalf of the Ummah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in terms of their sins. But first of all, prior to that, before the specific intercessions where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will plead on behalf of his nation particularly, there will be what we call a shafa'atul kubra, the major intercession or what we call the greatest intercession, where everybody is waiting for the accounting to begin on the Day of Judgment, and the accounting will be so long, and was so intense, that people will just want the accounting stop, even those who are disbelievers knowing that their end is the fire, will just want the accounting to stop, uh, will want the waiting to stop and the accounting to begin, even though they know that they are heading towards the fire, because the wait will be so terrifying. Who will intercede on behalf of all creation so that the waiting stops and the accounting begins? It will be the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This shafa'a will affect everybody in creation, the believer and disbeliever, because they all will be inside that waiting. However, once this waiting has stopped and the accounting has, begin, has begun, only the, messenger, only the nations, only the people from the nations of the prophets who believed in them, and followed them and died upon Iman will benefit from their specific intercessions. The Prophet وسلم, from his specific intercessions for his nation is that some people will be in the fire from, our, from the Ummah of the Prophet وسلم, and he will intercede and they will be taken out. Some will be being led to the fire and the Prophet وسلم, will be interceding for them, they won't even reach the fire. They will be placed into Jannah without being sent into the fire. Others will be in lower levels of Jannah their levels will be increased through the intercession. These specific intercessions, some of the scholars have mentioned, are lost for a person if he abandons the sunnah mu'akkada of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So taraweeh is an important act. And we will see at the end, towards the end of today's session, how taraweeh is connected with the concept of the recitation of the Qur'an and the listening of the Qur'an in the month of Ramadan. So taraweeh is an important act. The third act, so first fasting, Taraweeh in the night, so fasting during the daytime, Taraweeh, prayer, often it's called voluntary prayer, but we should know that in the Hanafi school, which is the majority school of the Ahl Sunnah in the world, most of the, uh, almost two thirds of the Muslims of the world follow the Hanafi school in terms of the rules relating to human actions, in terms of how they have been derived from the Quran and the Sunnah. According to that school, it is a Sunnah Mu'akkadah, it's an emphasized Sunnah. The third thing he mentions is the tilawah of the Holy Qur'an. And I will speak about this towards the end in more detail. Tilawah of the Qur'an, recitation of the Qur'an. And we could place inside it also the listening of the Qur'an as well. Listening to the Qur'an being recited by others. He mentions that the fourth act of worship, which is specific to Ramadan, i'tikaf. I'tikaf, what we call spiritual retreat. What we call secluding ourselves in the last 10 days of Ramadan inside the masjid in order to worship Allah Ta'ala and seek out the night of Laylatul Qadr and for the sisters secluding themselves in a portion of the home which they have specified for worship of Allah for prayer and they stay inside that area and they worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and one of the major purposes of the i'tikaf is to seek out that night which is known as Laylatul Qadr that the scholars have mentioned that one of the virtues, or what we call one of the purposes, hikmas, wisdoms of i'tikaf is that it places a person in the best possible position to make the most of the night of Laylatul Qadr, which many of the ulama deem to be one of the odd nights of the last 10 
of Ramadan and some have specified it even further than that and Allah knows best exactly which night it is from the nights of Ramadan some of the scholars have given even wider interpretation and say it's perhaps one of the nights of Ramadan even outside the last ten we should not part, let the nights of Ramadan pass except that we are in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we should avoid heedlessness a state of uh, inattention in the nights of Ramadan and in particular in the last ten also he mentions in relation to the five specific worships separate from i'tikaf itself because one of the other mighty purposes of i'tikaf is that one free himself up generally for worship whether it be in the night time or in the daytime, because he is cutting himself off from his connections with the world effectively he is cutting himself off and some of the scholars have described it in the way as though a person has come to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is as though he is saying though he's not saying with his tongue but his state of cutting himself from the world is as though a person has come and said oh Allah I come to your court and I do not want to leave your court except that you give me your mercy so Allah do not make me turn away from your court without having received your mercy so he is severing the ties of the world and he is freeing himself up for the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and he says that the last one, the fifth one then, he says worship inside Laylatul Qadr is a specific act of worship from the acts of Ramadan. So the five are fasting, taraweeh, the night prayer, tilawah of the Holy Quran, i'tikaf, secluding oneself in the last 10 days of Ramadan, either in the masjid for the brothers and in a specific place within the home for the sisters. And the fifth one he said is worshipping in the night of power by trying to seek it out in the nights of Ramadan those five he has mentioned we can also add to that though it's not specific to Ramadan it is an act of worship that is outside of Ramadan as well and we can see that fasting itself in terms of it being a non obligatory fast can be found outside of Ramadan and some of the other acts like worshiping the night other than Taraweeh can be found outside of Ramadan Another act which could, we could say is something that is deeply connected with Ramadan as well based upon the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam the hadith is in the Sahih of Imam Al-Bukhari and the narration says that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam كان أجود الناس he was the most generous of people وكان أجود ما يكون في رمضان and he was the most generous meaning his generosity was above all creation outside of Ramadan, in Ramadan, the Sahaba noted that it raised even more degrees inside Ramadan. So the, sah the Sahabi mentions that the Messenger of Allah was most generous inside the month of Ramadan. And then he mentions in relation to that, حِينَ يَلْقَاهُ جِبْرِيلُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ When the Messenger of Allah used to meet Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, no, in the nights of that Ramadan, that he would be even more intensely generous inside Ramadan and he said فَلَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَجْوَدُ بِالْخَيْمِ مِنَ الْرِيحِ الْمُرْسَلَةِ and to try and give an understanding of perhaps give a closeness to our minds in terms of, of the speed at which the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would part with wealth and give wealth to those that were in need he says that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was more generous than a fast flowing wind and if we look at far fast, fast flowing wind, and in particular in the circumstance of hot desert environment, when the wind comes, it gives relief. It gives co coolness and coldness, and a person benefits from it. So he's <coughs> indicating that how the Messenger of Allah would benefit others through being very, very generous in the month of Ramadan, and he was the most generous of a people even outside of Ramadan. This indicates that parting from our wealth, giving in charity, whether it be in the form of money or it be in the form of feeding others, these are acts also that a believer should try to engage in inside the month of Ramadan. So this could be a sixth thing that we mentioned in relation to a group of acts that inside Ramadan we should try and take from them in one way or another. So the first we mentioned was fasting. We also mentioned the prayer of Taraweeh, mentioned also i'tikaf in the nights of Ramadan the recitation of the Quran and we could link with that the listening to the Quran as well we also mentioned the act of seeking our worship in the night 
of Laylatul Qadr and we can add also to it this which is spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside the month of Ramadan this is also an act that a person should try to engage inside Ramadan this does not mean zakah only and by the way zakah is not specific to Ramadan many a person thinks that he needs to pay his zakah in Ramadan as though Ramadan is the set month in Islam in which zakah is paid there are rules related to zakah and whenever zakah becomes obligatory on a person he will have to pay that whether it be the month of Muharram that it becomes obligatory upon him or be the month of Ramadan or be month of Dhul Hijjah, the month of Hajj whichever month of the year in which a person's zakah is required to be given he must give it in that month without delay yes a person can give zakah in advance for example if his zakah is not due in Ramadan it is due two months later it is due for example in the month of Dhul Qi'dah you know after Ramadan is Shawwal after that is Dhul Qi'dah his month his zakah is actually due two months time he can give it in advance he can give it adva- in advance inside the month of Ramadan or even before and if he wants the virtue of giving in Ramadan he gives it in Ramadan because he is giving it in advance it is not yet due but a person should not delay their zakah into Ramadan meaning it is due four months earlier and he does not pay it waiting for, waiting for Ramadan and that's a whole chapter and discussion itself some of the brothers have mentioned that we should do a, a workshop perhaps on uh, the, uh, the uh, rules of, of zakah and that's something inshallah ta'ala we can look at as well inside the month of Ramadan or the early part of Ramadan inshallah ta'ala what are the rules of zakah itself so we saw inside this uh, extraction the scholars have mentioned these matters of worship that are important inside the month of Ramadan and I wanted to give a bit of focus on side on the act of worship known as the recitation of the Quran but before that if we mention regarding fasting fasting itself which is a major act of worship inside the month of Ramadan and it takes up the daytime of a person inside Ramadan if we look at the nature of the act of fasting the word Sawm itself it comes from the meaning of Habs or what we call restrainment or confining someone if you say you put someone in Habs inside Arabic it means you've imprisoned him you've restrained him so if you think about it what is the meaning that is coming out from this the meaning inside the act of Sawm the act of fasting and it's restraining we are restraining our lower selves we are restraining our desires we are restraining all of these for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refraining from eating refraining from drinking re- refraining from relationship with our spouses why are we refraining from all of these things why are we putting the lower self in restrainment and holding it back from its desires to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to attain to again like we mentioned to attain to piety the scholars have said also in the meaning of soul is the meaning of the word sabr the meaning of the word Patience. The psalm actually from its linguistic meanings is in meaning, meaning its meanings within the Arabic language the word psalm from its meanings is the word sabr. Sabr means patience. What are we being patient upon? Again, patient upon the fact that we cannot eat and drink and we are ref- refraining from these things and restraining ourselves from these things to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to attain to what? Piety. From the things which the scholars have mentioned in relation to fasting is some amazing events that relate to some of the scholars of Islam and I'll mention one of them. Imam Sha'arani, Imam Abdul Wahab al-Sha'arani rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi, his name is famous from amongst the scholars of Islam, in particular in the sphere of what we call tasawwuf, inner self-purification. And it is mentioned that once he was in the Jami at Masjid in Damascus, and he was in the state of fasting. Allah knows best whether it was the month of Ramadan or outside the month of Ramadan. That people actually saw him levitating from the ground. People actually saw him levitating above the ground. And it was only when food was given for him to open his fast and he ate it that he came back down. The scholars have mentioned that the soul, the ruh, the ruh in comparison to the jasad, the body, is light. And the nature of the soul is something that we know little about. We know little about but what we do know from what the scholars have mentioned that the soul in comparison to the body is light if you think about it human beings and the jinn are called thakalan thakalin yep thakalan and the other arabic 
فوم استقالين why call why they call ثقلان and we'll finish in شاء الله تعالى prior to that mention again regarding this narrative that I mentioned regarding Imam Abdul Wahab al-Sha'arani rahmatullahi ta'ala we said that the two creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the three that have been given intelligence the scholars mentioned there are three creatures creations of Allah that have been given intelligence the malaika the angels the jinn kind <laughs> and mankind and from the three two have been given apart from intelligence have been given choice the malaika have been given intelligence but they never disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are in perpetual obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mankind and jinn kind have been given intelligence and have also been given choice and they will be accounted for their choices inside this world they are called thaqalan and thaqil means in Arabic heavy they are heavy upon this earth and when they are buried inside the body of the earth they are heavy upon this earth as well so we find that a person's soul in the state of fasting a person is restricting himself from the worldly matters that connect to his desires his soul rises and if we look at the nature of the fasting we are told that perchance you may become pious so we see one of the mighty purposes of fasting is to gain piety in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we need to look at the nature of our fasting that how is our fasting in relation to this purpose that has been set as a purpose for the fasting person from amongst the scholars of Islam, Imam Abu Bakr al-Haddad al-Zabidi, who is one of the Hanafi scholars, uh, he is buried in the land of Yemen, rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. He is also considered from the awliya of Yemen. He writes in his work that fasting is of three levels. So this was the first act of worship. We said we'd go in a bit more detail. It encompasses the daytime inside Ramadan. He says fasting is of three levels. The fasting of the lay people, the lay people are people who never attend the lessons that are given by scholars, never read the books of the scholars. They generally do not engage in acquiring Islamic learning. So they are considered lay people having very little understanding of Islam. He says the fasting of the lay people is the first level. The second level is the fasting of the special people. And then he says the third degree is the fasting of the elite people. We'll talk about those two categories in a minute. The fasting of the lay people, the person who does not study, does not have Islamic knowledge, uh, even in basic form, does not attend the lessons of the scholars, uh, acquire knowledge uh, from the books of the scholars. He says their fasting is to restrain the desires of the stomach and the private parts. That's their restrainment. That's their understanding of patience and restrainment. And they enact their understanding as much as they can inside Ramadan. They avoid the desires of the body. He says the fasting of the second category is the fasting of the special people and inshallah ta'ala we are all, all from that though we wouldn't consider ourselves special but we are from the perspective of that we attend the lessons of the scholars we read the books of the scholars we listen to the lectures of the scholars we try to acquire some knowledge for this reason we've been given this title special yeah that we're special in, cons in comparison to those that do not access the scholars at all do not try to acquire any knowledge at all so we have a greater responsibility on us as well if we're going to be inside this category he says these people are the people that not only restrict themselves from food drink and relationship with their spouses but they go a degree higher they prevent the hearing the sight the tongue the hand the feet every limb of the body they restrain it restrict it from that which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited Thus their fasting and their restrainment is of a higher level. Their tarbiyah is away. They, uh, they're improving themselves and they're developing themselves is a development which is at a greater level. They have understood the fast at a higher level. That Allah is asking us to restrain. And that means restraining our body completely from that which is haram. Not just not eating and not drinking and not having a relationship with our spouses but also making sure that our hands don't move towards something which is haram. We don't look at something which is haram. We don't say something which is haram, and so on and so forth. Then we are told there is a third category, and they are the elite people of Allah. They are the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the people that have learnt the outward sciences, and learned the inward sciences, and they have understood the fasting to such a degree 
that not only do they fulfill the first category and rise up into the second category, but they move to a third category in which they even refrain and restrain the very thoughts that go through their mind and the very thoughts that pass through their hearts from anything other than thinking about the worship of Allah. In other words, they prevent their minds and hearts in the month of Ramadan from reflecting upon and thinking about anything except the worship of Allah, the attainment of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they are the elite group of this ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed these people within the ummah. But we as a group of people who attend the lessons of the scholars and listen to the lectures of the scholars and read their books and acquire knowledge are, are continuously, inshallah, trying to improve our understanding of Islam, our implementation of Islam. We should not allow ourselves to be in the first category at all. We should not allow ourselves to be in the first category at all. We should be aiming for the second category at the very least. That we work towards preventing our eyes, our ears, our hands and our body parts from haram. In other words, we fast a fast of the entire body. Our entire body fasts from that which is impermissible. Moving to that part which I said I will concentrate a bit more on and I think is very important that we focus on in Ramadan. We are told in the description of Ramadan in verse 185 of Surah Al-Baqarah Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an The month of Ramadan, which month? How is it described? What is the description? How does Allah describe it to us and explain it to us? The month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was sent down. So Ramadan is being described in relation to the Qur'an being sent down into, inside it. So this is very important that we focus on this. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. What does this mean? The scholars say that the Qur'an was revealed to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over a period of 26 years. Over a period of, sorry, 23 years. Over a period of 23 years, from the time the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received the first revelation at the age of 40, 13 years in Makkah al mukarramah and then 10 years of the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam inside Madinah al Munawwarah, 23 years from the first verse, اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received the Qur'an, it was revealed to him in accordance with various situations he encountered inside his life until he was veiled from this world. So what is the meaning of the Qur'an being revealed inside Ramadan? Then? The scholars have mentioned that the Qur'an was revealed from the divine preserved tablet. The creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala known as the preserved tablet, Allah al mahfuz the preserved tablet. The Qur'an was sent down from the preserved tablet to the sky of this world and from there Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam over a period of 23 years took the revelation in accordance with various circumstances that happened in the life of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Allah ordered Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam to take the revelation to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Qur'an was placed inside a place called Baytul Izzah. Baytul Izzah is a house which is inside, a structure which is inside the low sky of this world. The low skies of this world, we know there are seven skies. The seven skies, that in the low sky of this world, of this world there is a structure called Baytul Izzah. Allah knows the nature of that structure. It's called the house of dignity or the, the house of honor. And the Qur'an was placed inside that place and Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam was ordered to take the Qur'an over a period of 23 years to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That revealing of the Qur'an from Allah al-Mahfuz, the divine, the preserved tablet, to the sky of this world, to Baytul Izza, a structure which is above the Kaaba, above the Kaaba in the sky of this world. Just like we know there is inside the seventh skies, where Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the seventh sky, he uh, met, met Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. On the night of Islam al Mi'raj, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam was resting against a structure called Baytul Ma'mur. Baytul Ma'mur is a structure in the seventh skies around which the Malaika performs circumambulation tawaf. And it is directly above the Kaaba of this world. Correct. Thus, inside the low sky of this world, the Quran was revealed on the night of power, Laylatul Qadr from Allah al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet, to the sky of this world and placed inside Baytul Izzah, 
on Laylatul Qadr, and this is what is being referred to inside the verse according to the scholars of Tafsir, where we read the month of Ramadan in which the Quran was sent down. This particular sending down is being referred to on the night of power Laylatul Qadr. The scholars have mentioned if we understand this then, then we see the significance of recital of Quran and listening to Quran and being connected to Quran in the month in which the Quran was sent down from the preserved tablet to sky of this world. We also know inside the Quran in Surah Al-Qadr, we are told, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Undoubtedly we sent it down in the night of power. And it, the scholars have, be, have referred to here, it being referred to here, sorry, the scholars have mentioned is the Quran. That the Quran was sent down, undoubtedly we sent it down, meaning the Quran, in the night of power. Also, in Surah Dukhan, in the early verses, we are told, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatin mubarakatin inna kunna mundirin. Undoubtedly we sent it, meaning the Quran, in a blessed night. Many of the Mufassirun, many of the scholars of Tafsir believe this is Laylatul Qadr. There is a group of scholars who believe this is the night that is approaching, which is the night of the middle of Sha'ban, which we call Shabi Bara'at, or Laylatul Bara'ah, Laylatul Nism in Sha'ban, the middle night of Sha'ban, which is between Tuesday and Wednesday, in the coming week, some of the scholars are of the opinion that that night is being mentioned here. And Allah knows best, or the majority of the scholars say, taking the uh, Surah, Surah Al-Qadr, and also taking this into context and the verse inside Surah Al-Baqarah, they say that the night being referred to here also is the night of Laylatul Qadr, which is a night from the nights of Ramadan. We've already heard the hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam already part of it, where we are told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was extremely generous inside Ramadan. Inside that hadith, it's mentioned at the time when he would meet Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam, and it's mentioned fi kulli laylatin min Ramadan, he would meet Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam every night inside the month of Ramadan. Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam would come and meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We need to know what was the nature of this meeting. What can we take from this meeting of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam every single night of Ramadan? What important thing is going on every night of Ramadan in the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It is فَيُدَارِسُهُ Quran That Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam would come and there would be the recitation of the Quran occurring between Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Imam Ibn Hajar Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi his understanding of this hadith is that Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would read to Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam and then Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam would also read to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran would be revised twice. Once from the direction of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and once from the direction of Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam. This would indicate two recitations in the night. One from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and one from Sayyidina Jibreel Alayhi Salaam and would indicate recitation and listening. Recital and listening to the Quran. And Allah knows best the exact meaning of that part of the uh, hadith, that the Quran would, would be revised between them. He says, the, uh, sorry, the scholars mention in relation to this, that if we look inside this, that the Quran is being recited, and also the Quran is being listened to. If we take the understanding of Imam Ibn Hajar, each of the two recited, and each of the two listened. And if we take some of the opinions of the others, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recited and Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, listen. This indicates to us that the recitation of the Quran is an important act of worship inside the month of Ramadan. That a person not only recites it, but that he also listens to it. And that the initial revelation of the Quran to the heavens of this world occurred inside this month again emphasizes the importance of the Quran in the life of a believer, in particular in the month of Ramadan. It's, he says also that the fact that the hadith also mentions the generosity of the Prophet ﷺ inside the month of Ramadan in relation to reciting the Quran in the nights with Sayyidina Jibreel ﷺ indicates that constancy of recitation increases good in the life of a believer. Now, there's a lesson in this for the believers. That Constancy in reciting the Quran increases khair, good, in the life of a believer. It also then increases one in one's generosity to others. Also, the scholars have extracted from this narration that it is mustahab, recommended, 
deemed good that a person recites a lot inside the month of Ramadan. If the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam each night was meeting with Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam and in the entire month, an entire recitation of the Qur'an was being completed across the entire month. So in the entire month, every night, meeting Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, an entire recitation was completed by the end of the month. This also indicates to us that we should, as followers of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and obviously this is just the recitation in the night with Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, in relation to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not mentioning what the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa recited apart from that in the night and apart from that in the day. A believer should try and make a target for himself that he recites at least one completion of the Quran in the month of Ramadan, taking from this narration that he allots himself a portion. Him, he him, himself or herself every day places a target that he tries to complete a portion so that by the end of the 30 days they have completed entire recitation of the Quran. It also indicates that revising the Qur'an with others, not just reciting by ourselves, but that there's khair, good, inside reciting with others, so that one recites and the other listens. The other recites and the first listens, and so forth. It also indicates that, and this is one of the lessons for us as an ummah, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without doubt, is the greatest of all creation. And he's the most knowledgeable of all creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he was revising the Quran with Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam. But the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in daraja, in rank is greater than Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, in knowledge and rank in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They say this indicates to us that a person should take a lesson from it. A person should not think himself far above that he has reached such a level of knowledge that he cannot benefit from someone that is lower in rank or level than him. But this is a lesson for the ummah. Don't think that we have learned so much that we can't take knowledge from someone that has less knowledge than us, but something from his knowledge that we can take from it, or that we can benefit from it, or that we can practice and learn with him, and we can revise with him. That a person should have humility. This is being shown to the ummah through the action of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It also indicates from one angle that the nights of Ramadan are more virtuous than the daytime. The nights of Ramadan are more virtuous generally than the daytime. It also indicates from one angle that recitation at night, because this was happening at night between the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, that recitation at night is favored in the sense that not that we should abandon reciting during the day, but that we should not forget to leave a portion of recital of the Quran for the night. And I'm talking about outside of Tarawih. Yes, in Taraweeh, like I mentioned, we're going to listen to the Qur'an recite, recited by others. And if we're praying on our own, we're going to be reciting ourselves and concentrating on our recital. But apart from the recital of the Qur'an inside Taraweeh, at night inside Ramadan, we should still uh, uh, leave a portion of Qur'an for ourselves and leave it that we should recite it at night. Because from the hadith, the scholars are saying, it indicates recitation at night has a virtue above recitation during the day in Ramadan. And one of the possible wisdoms they said is that at night there is less preoccupation. People are not preoccupied with work, dealing with their children, dealing with their families, the women preparing food and so forth. But there's time to what? Reflect. There's time what? To reflect on the Quran. No children, no food to prepare, no work to engage in. Find some time at night so that we can reflect. Reflection at a time when there is less preoccupation means that we are listening to our recital of the Qur'an or listening to the recital of others and trying to ponder upon the meanings possibly of the Qur'an <laughs> away from the things which uh, take us away from that inside the day. From the other hadith that I mentioned regarding the virtues of fasting, uh, of, of uh, recitation of the Qur'an is the hadith in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said As-siyam wal-Qur'anu yashfa'ani lil-abdi yawm al-qiyamah that on the day of judgment siyam fasting and the Qur'an will intercede for the believer on the day of judgment. The fasting will say, Oh my Lord, I prevented him from food and the desires during the day. So accept my intercession for him. The Qur'an will say, Oh Allah, I prevented him from sleep at night. So accept my intercession in relation to him. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will be said on the day of judgment, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is said in the hadith, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their intercession and their both intercessions on behalf of the believer will be accepted. Note inside this, it says, The Qur'an will say, I prevented him from sleeping at night. 
Again, this seems to indicate, and Allah knows best, the virtue of recitation of the Quran at night in relation to that which is done in the morning. And this could, some of the scholars have indicated, mean recitation in Qiyam, recitation in, in prayer, recitation in prayer, and Allah knows best. So this could indicate to prayer in the night, either Taraweeh inside the month of Ramadan, or could indicate to other nawafil a person is reciting inside the month of Ramadan. But also, we should not uh, n neglect also recitation outside of prayer as well. And we should have a portion of recitation outside of the prayer at night as well. And we know the many virtues, of, there are many virtues of the recitation of the Quran. Uh, from the hadith of Sunan of Tirmidhi, where we are told that whoever recites one word from the book of Allah, he has a hasana. And a hasana is in accordance to ten likenesses of it. Meaning one good deed is multiplied by ten. So we have a good deed, but it's multiplied by ten. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that I do not say that Alif Lam Mim is a harf, but that Alif is a harf. So it has its own hasana multiplied by ten. Lam is a harf, it has its own good deed multiplied by ten. And Mim is a harf and it has its own good uh, deed multiplied by ten. So we informed here that recital of the Quran, every letter, there is multitude benefit inside it for the believer. From that which the early generations would do in closing, in preparation for Ramadan, is that this month, Sha'ban, you would find that they would close down those that had businesses, like shops, they would close down their shops. They would close them down in preparation for Ramadan. The rulers that were righteous in the early, gen early generations, they would try to resolve all the affairs of their kingdom inside this month. So if there were any cases that they had to adjudicate over and give a ruling over, they would bring those case cases forward and they would give their judgments now. Why? They wanted to free themselves up for Ramadan. Thus, ourselves, we should see if we can find, perhaps we have holidays that we can take from work, take them in Ramadan. Free yourself up for the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there's things that we need to do in the house, like our families are telling us that we need to repair something in the house and we haven't done it for many months, don't leave it for Ramadan. Do it now if we can. If we can't uh, solve it before Ramadan, leave it for after Ramadan. We don't want to be engaged in other things inside Ramadan. That's what we see in the lives of the Salaf, of the early generation. And in fact, this month, the month of Sha'ban, was known as Shahrul Qurra, the month of reciters. If you think about it, this is before Ramadan. So imagine what they were reciting in Ramadan, that their recitation inside this month was so much, that this month, Sha'ban, in the early generations was called the month of the reciters. What the Salaf, the early generations, the Sahaba and the two generations that followed them, the, the early generations, what they were doing this month is they would begin to increase their recitation of the Quran in preparation for Ramadan. That's what a believer should do. He should prepare himself for Ramadan. One of the ways he can prepare himself is that if he's got a target in Ramadan of finishing, for example, one khatma, one completion of the Quran, and he doesn't normally read that much every day outside of Ramadan, he needs to get himself into that mode. And the way he'll do that, or, he, she, or she will do that, is by reciting a little bit now in preparation to get to a level that they enter into Ramadan, they're already reciting. Otherwise, we'll get into the first day, maybe recite two, chap, uh, two uh, sparas, two Jews of the Quran, and then the rest of Ramadan, a few ayahs every day. We don't want to be like that. It's better to be regular and read a little than to be a, a person who does a lot once and then leaves. So whatever target we have, make it something that is achievable and begin the preparation now. So we see the early generations, it's mentioned, they would close their shops and they would begin to free themselves up for the Quran. In fact, the scholars of Islam like Imam Malik, the ones who would teach other subjects like hadith, it said that Imam Malik, when the month of Ramadan would approach, he would stop teaching a hadith and he would begin to sit and recite the Quran. In other words, he would turn his attention in terms of teaching and the subjects that he is concentrating on will turn his attention to, towards the Book of Allah. Because the Quran, is, uh, the Quran is deeply connected with the month of Ramadan, having been revealed in the night of power from the preserved tablet to the sky of this world. We also note that the early generations, they would prepare for, for the month of Ramadan. Some of them would prepare, like we mentioned, six months in advance. From the things that we need to watch out for inside our reality is that the fast is very long. So the body needs to be prepared for the month of Ramadan. We don't have many days in Sha'ban left. But Sha'ban is that month in which we are told the Messenger of Allah would fast a lot. So before this month is out, 
we should prepare ourselves also for the month of Ramadan by fasting some days. And from the, from the days in which we've received uh, some guidance in the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu regarding their virtue is the 15th day of Sha'ban <coughs> in the hadith that is narrated from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala in the sunnah of Ibn Majah in which we are being, have been told that when the 15th night of Sha'ban comes that we should stand the night in prayer in observing worship of Allah and we should spend the day inside fasting. The 15th day is Wednesday insha'Allah ta'ala. That is something that we should take as our preparation for Ramadan. That we fast the day of the 15th of Sha'ban, Wednesday insha'Allah ta'ala. Also in preparation for Ramadan, if we are hoping to seek the mercy and forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should not leave that to just Ramadan. We should start making tawbah and seek forgiveness straight away. Whichever state we are in, we should be people that are perpetually in the state of asking forgiveness and making tawbah, not leaving it for just Ramadan. The night of the 15th of Sha'ban is an important night for seeking forgiveness in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to take from the remaining days of Sha'ban and give us the goodness of Ramadan. Inshallah ta'ala next week, don't worry if you didn't manage to capture everything we mentioned today, there are notes. They just need a bit of refining in terms of some of the things I mentioned uh, in terms of the Quran. I'm not inside those. Inshallah ta'ala will present you with notes for this lesson in next lesson and there's notes already prepared regarding the rules of Ramadan for next week. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ربي زدنا علما ولحقنا بالصالحين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين برحمتك يا رحمة الله